Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. I'm back in our Father's Word, book of Jeremiah. He whom God launches for, chapter 32. Now, our Father giving a promise. He said, hey, I'm going to restore my favorite mountain, Mount Zion. As a matter of fact, I'm going to restore my people. It's called restitution. And he said, just to make good on that, I want, Jeremiah, I want you to take, uh, you purchase this land, you're locked up in prison, but the next of kin will be there and he'll ask you to buy the land, and you go then and put the deed in a bottle and seal it that'll last a long, long time. Now, you know, and go to Anathoth, which is the priest's town. It means answer to prayer in the Hebrew tongue. It's, a, it's just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. It's, it's only a priest can buy land there and, and could at that time. And he said, seal it where it lasts a long time. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls were in jars that weren't even sealed. And you can still make out pretty good what they say. And naturally, this deed that is sealed and preserved uh, in this bottle, it's going to be real easy to read, and it's going to show ownership to that property. But our father continues then about the restitution, about, hey, you're going to be there. You're going to love it. You're going to enjoy it. Why? You're my children. So with that thought being relayed, let's pick it up, if we may, chapter 32, verse 18, with that thought continuing. Verse 18 reads, Thou showedest loving kindness unto thousands, speaking of our Father, and recompenseth the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, how is that after chapter 31, verse 29? He said, if the, if the uh, child... Uh, bites a sour grape, it's not going to affect the Father. I mean, we still answer for our own sins, but what it means is if the Father has iniquity, he's going to correct it. If the Son has iniquity, he's going to correct it. Everybody answers for their own sins, okay? Verse 19, great in counsel, our Father is, you ever listen to him, and mighty in work, for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give every one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now, you know, if you wonder why some people are blessed and some aren't, you, want to, you might analyze that verse. Okay. Because father, father is aware very much. Now, Father will push his elect around because he has a purpose for them. But otherwise, if, uh, if you do bad deeds, guess what? God's not going to bless you. If you, are a sin, if you, if you commit sin without repentance, you're going to pay for it. Okay. You always get what you got coming to you. If it's blessings, then you'll be blessed. And if it's cursing, you will be cursed. Um, you might say, well, how, how can you say that? Well, don't you remember chapter 17, verse 5? What did it say? In the same book, Jeremiah, it says, Cursed is the man that puts his trust in man instead of God. God observes he knows even what you're thinking. <clears throat> and um, you don't have to wait till, until heaven to receive blessings from God. He, in this verse, lets you know he's all-knowing and all-seeing. Therefore, he, he tends to each person individually with respect to that, that's why it never hurts to let him know you love him. I don't, you don't have to say it out loud, wherever you are. Let him know you love him. That pays great dividends because that's the number one item he wants from you, is your love. Verse 20, 
which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even unto this day, and in Israel and among other men, and has made thee a name as at this day. Everybody knows our father, he parted the Red Sea. People talk about that even to this day. He, he um, provided manna and quail in the wilderness, fed his children. He always looks out for them. Uh, and um, gave us the Ten Commandments. And with Moses on that rock, and of course what happened when he came down, the children had betrayed him. They had built a golden, and molded a golden calf and were worshiping it. So, but we have these signs from our Father. He's always letting you know, I'm here. Verse 21, And has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs, and with wonders, and with a strong hand, and with a stretched out arm, and with great terror. You know, even as those signs he gave then are duplicated in Revelation chapter 11, concerning the two witnesses, the water turned to blood and so forth. There's a reason for this. Okay. This is what we learn by. For there's nothing new under the sun, and what has been comes around again. The thing is, will, have you read it, and will you recognize it when it comes around again? Verse 22, And has given them this land, which thou didst swear to their fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And now we have the bottles buried and sealed, hidden, whereby Father knows exactly where it's at. And it is a promise, it is the evidence that he has promised that land to them. You know, we, we stopped in the last uh, lecture in verse 17 where it says, the great power and stretched out arm of God, and there is nothing too hard for thee. That word hard should be translated hidden. There's nothing hidden from our Father. He, 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 he knows everything. That's why you always get what you got coming to you. That makes some people very nervous. It shouldn't, because if you deserve blessings, then God bless you. You will be. Verse 23. And they came in and possessed it, the land that is. But they obeyed not thy voice, neither walked in thy law. They have done nothing of all that thou commandest them to do. Therefore thou hast caused all this evil to come upon them. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is knocking on the door. The king of Babylon is there. And what does this let you know about the end times? The king of Babylon's coming of the great book of Revelation. And it's none other than the false Messiah himself. What is the purpose? Mark 13, you're to be delivered up and witnessed by the Holy Spirit speaking through you. 24, behold the mounts, they are come in unto the city to take it, and the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, that fight against it because of the sword and of the famine, and of the pestilence, and what thou hast spoken is come to pass, and behold, thou seest it. All those uh, plagues, and even as it will be with the plagues of the end times, the wrath of God poured out. So it will be in this same geographical location. 25, And thou hast said unto me, O Lord God, buy thee the field for money, and take witnesses for the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. In other words, what this does, it preserves restoration. It preserves it, meaning all the time the title is buried right there at Anathoth. It belongs to God's children. It belongs to the Christian nations, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, both the good and the bad figs, but only the good figs are in that deed. The bad, not so. Verse 26, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, 27, Behold, you look here, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh, not just part of it, all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Question. The answer is absolutely not. God created all flesh, meaning all races. He created them the way he wanted them on the sixth day, and he looked, and it was good. 
Verse 28, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. It's going to come to pass. Now, you can rest assured in the end times, as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as Paul is teaching, he says, hey, don't worry about Christ coming back at the second advent. It's not going to happen, and we're not going to gather back to him until after the son of perdition stands in Jerusalem in the holy place claiming to be God. It's just not going to happen. And, and you can rest assured that's true. Only he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Uh, Michael's guarding him now, but he's going to cast him out. He's coming as the false messiah. So uh, when God says he gave us this example of the king of Babylon of old, and it's going to happen again. The king of Babylon is coming. Verse 29, And the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that fight against this city shall come and set fire on this city and burn it with the houses upon whose roofs they have offered incense unto Baal and poured out drink offerings unto other gods to provoke me to anger, God is saying. Righteous indignation there. Our, our father's not happy. You know, and you can't blame him. When he says over and over, hey, Stop and think a moment. I made the universe. I created the stars in heaven. I created this earth and everything in it. I created all flesh. And you treat me this way. I, I see everything. I know everything. And nothing is impossible with me. And you would snub at me? You would build you some little idol when you got me? You can understand why, you know, that would, that would be quite a put down. If you were the majesty, he on high, and you had children and they run around worshiping falseness. Verse 30, for the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger with the work of their hands, saith the Lord, building their, whittling their little idols and building their little houses, calling it houses of God and this Beth of In, nothing there. My word's never taught there, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. He's not happy about it and, and has a right to, to be unhappy with his children. You know, especially when they try to remove his name from even our vocabulary, when, when the politically correct uh, uh, mojos try to talk Christians into mellowing down where you'll accept anything, well, we won't. There's, there's uh, many of us never have and never will. Um, we, we, God has chosen us and we chose him and we stick with him. I don't care whether it's politically correct or not. It's what is morally correct that counts. Verse 31. For this city has been to me as a provocation of mine anger and of my fury from the day that thou built it, even unto this day, that I should remove it from before my face. <clears throat> and you know, this, has, this must hurt him. I mean, he said, all this is going on in my favorite place, the place I, I took to wife, even, if you want to speak geographically. I saw her when the Jebusites farmed her, and it was called Jebus, and she get, had an unclean birth, the city did. And, and, and then she grew to maturity, and I took her, and I married her. And I make an eternal, everlasting covenant with this geographical location. It's where I'm going to establish heaven. I'm, I'm quoting from Ezekiel chapter 16. But he says, you've done this here in my favorite place. And that's why it provokes him. Verse 32, because of all the evil of the children of Israel and of the children of Judah, both tribes split, houses split, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And you know what prophets he's talking about here and what priests he's talking about? Not his. 
They're not, they're not God's prophets. They're not God's priests. They're priests of Baal. Well, how can you tell the difference? Well, test the fruit. Are they teaching God's word? Are they giving God credit for being the creator of all things? Verse 33. And they have turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. They will not listen. You know, your father makes it very clear all you got to do to be blessed. And mainly he expects you to be true to him. He expects you to live a, a life that is befitting a, a child of God. A child of God doesn't rebuke God or turn his back on him and instead he turns his face and a, a smiling face letting him know you love him. And so it is that uh, he has every right to be upset because not only are, are the children uh, rebelling against him but they're filthying up the very place that is his favorite habitation on earth. Verse 34. But they set their abomination in the house. I mean, right in the middle of it. Which is called by my name to defile it. Um, and what does this mean ultimately? They're going to put the Antichrist right in Mount Zion. He's going to set up shop there calling himself the living God. The God of all people, of whatever you worship, I'm it. And you know, unfortunately for most people, it's not what you are showing in propaganda that the end comes with destruction and, and um, abomination and that dis uh, of destruction, but he comes in prosperously and peacefully. It's going to throw a lot of people out of gear. They're not expecting Satan to have a smile on his face and say, I love you. I'll take care of you. Come under my wing. So you can rest assured the abomination is going to come right into the house of God. <clears throat> How many will recognize it? 35. And they built the high place of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hanan, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire of Moloch, which I commanded them not. I didn't order them. Now there came it into my mind. I didn't even think such a filthy thought. But they should do this, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin, both the good fig and bad fig. You know, um, do, you, do you know what the Valley of Hinnon is? It's right, it runs right there beside the great Mount Zion, and it's called, uh, it's the same place uh, in which uh, Gehenna, which is the Valley of Hinnon, but it's a garbage pit, which burns and smolders night and day, and that's why God would, Jesus, when he walked the earth, would cause it, call it an example of what hell will be like. He said, you build your own fire there. And not only that, you put your own kids into it. And when you teach falsely and mislead your children, whereby they go astray, when, <clears throat> when they are run to the false Christ instead of the true, when they want to be the first one taken and the taken first is done by Antichrist, they are so sorely misled by the traditions of men that make void this word of God. God's not happy with it. He said, all that junk has never even entered my mind, and you feed it to them, your own children. They're going to end up in Gehenna, right there in the valley of Hinnon, which is hell on earth. <clears throat> Verse 36. And now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, that house, concerning this city, whereof you say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Uh, it, it's, it shall be. Okay. Verse 37, Behold, you look. I will gather them out of all countries whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury. 
and in great wrath, and I will bring them again into this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. Uh, what, what was the requirement for this? Uh, remember the last chapter along about verse 19 where it said, redeem, redemption, ask for forgiveness, repentance, to repent. This is to the children that love God. Not to people that decide to worship a heathen god, to say Satan. I would hope that um, why the very deed is necessary. Why is the deed necessary? To document who owns it. Those that truly follow the living God. Verse 38. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. That's those that know the difference between Ami and Lo Ami, okay? The, coming from the book of Hosea, salvation. Lo Ami is not my people. You don't want to fall into that category. You fall into that category by steeping yourself in the traditions of men rather than God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. God said, you don't, you don't teach my word in my house chapter by chapter and verse by verse. You bring in the false teaching and plant it right in Bethel, my house. And then you wonder why he's unhappy. Let's go on with the next verse, please. Verse 39. And I will give them one heart, those that repent, one mind, and one way. Well, what way is that? Christ. Christ is the way that they may fear me forever, revere me. Fear means revere, love, or fear, for the good of them and of their children after them. In other words, that's the way it's going to be. I'm going to do it that way. I'm going to make it that way. Why? Well, he loves his children. God has always loved his children, and what he wants from them is their love. I think you. I think it would. It is not difficult for you to understand that as much as nothing is hidden from Him, and when people will not, I mean, will not follow His word, or even make an attempt to try to understand it, to be pleasing to God, and then wonder why He doesn't bless them. What a joke! What What could you possibly be thinking? If you want God's blessings, you've got to be a blessing to Him because he blesses those that bless him by studying. It's not difficult to follow him. It's simply to let him know you enjoy the letter he sent and absorb it because it gives you life, and I'm talking eternal life. You'll be in the group that inherits this forever. What an opportunity. What a time to live. Verse 40 to continue. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. That's the eternity. That I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. That's kind of future yet for the gathering and the end gathering on the first day of the millennium when every knee bows to him. But the group that repents it's such a difference to be in the group of the first resurrection because certainly not everybody's going to make it. Those that are in the first resurrection, they r receive not only a spiritual body that is eternal, but they receive an immortal soul as 1 Corinthians 15, 52 stipulates. That is forever. The immortal soul causes the spiritual body to be forever also. Now, all are raised in spiritual bodies, but some only have mortal souls, meaning liable to die at judgment at the end of the millennium by their actions there. You know, God gives his children every chance. Oh, how many chances he gave Satan in the first earth age, and he flunked out on every one of them. Make sure that as loving as our Father is, that you don't miss the covenant. That's a contract <clears throat> of, of pleasing him. Verse 41. 
yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will plant them in this land. Assuredly, you can count on it. In truth, with my whole heart and with my whole soul. That's God pouring his out. Do you want to be a part of that? It's really quite simple. All you have to do is love him and follow him. You don't have to wait for these blessings from him and the fact of doing good. All you have to do is repent. Ask him to use you. You see, there's much, there's, the harvest is plentiful and the, the workers are few that truly understand the truth. So volunteer. Ask him to use you. That simply means to plant a seed or to, for him to use you wherever he sees fit and then wait on him. Don't try to push out on your own and fall in the ditch. Do it his way and be blessed. That's his promise. You love me, you follow me, I will do good for you. Do you know something? You can count on that. It is the truth. Assuredly, it is. Verse 42. For thus saith the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. Just as I'm bringing the king of Nebuchadnezzar in, that's to say the Antichrist, bring it on. I want to know who's done what. I want to know how many will worship him in ignorance. I want to know who will stand against him. I want to know who my children truly are, right down in the bottoms of their heart. That, that's why I had to bring this on them. You, you understand why, of course, don't you? Because he's dealing with forever and ever and ever. If you're, if you're going to be one that can't quite make your mind up that you want to love your father, hey, you're not going to make it to heaven. Why? Because there's not going to be any halfways there. You're either going to be all in loving the Father, or you're not going to make it. Okay. You know, all of us fall short, and all of us have sins, and we repent of those. You're in good standing. But to deliberately go against him and worship someone else like the false Christ, that, that has short, that's a short-term operation, my friend. I mean, he, Satan, is a dead man walking. He's already sentenced to death. The only reason God allows him to walk is he's got a little more work to see how many will worship him. Do you understand that's the reason Christ went into the wilderness to be tempted of him to show you how to get it done? I mean, what did, again, what did Satan tempt Christ with? Scripture. You've got to be familiar enough with the scripture because Satan is a scripture lawyer whereby you know and understand what he's up to and how he can deceive. But it looks so holy. It seems so holy. Yeah, holy all the way with a one-way ticket if you're not real careful, my friend. Your father is very easy to please. All you have to do is let him know you love him, repent of all sins, and, and note, we're, we, we may, we're in the flesh. Flesh is weak. But... He forgives. Why? That's true love, because he does love us. Uh, he's going to keep all things that he promised. Verse 43 to continue. And field shall be bought in this land, whereof you say, it is desolate without man and beast. It is given unto the hand of the Chaldeans. It's been given to the Babylonians. We're going to take it back. And... Um, and it, it will be God's special place. Verse 44, to complete the chapter, men shall buy fields for money and subscribe evidences and seal them, that's deeds, and hang on to them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin and in the places about Jerusalem, that's where Anathoth is, and in the cities of Judah, and in the cities of the mountains, and in the cities of the valley, and in the cities of the south, for I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. In other words, I'm bringing my children back. 
And so it is. That our Father, he, he, restitution is a cinch. It's going to happen. But it's going to happen God's way. Well, why would he have to bring the king of Babylon on top of us? He wants to know if you've done your homework. The king of Babylon can have no effect whatsoever on you when you stand in Christ. Christ, in the great book of Luke, in chapter 10, along about verse 18, gave us power over all of our enemies, including Satan, in Christ's name, of course. You don't have to worry about the end times, and you certainly do not have to worry about being deceived when you have the seal of God in your forehead, which simply means the truth from God's word. Why? Because you've covered it. You understand it. And you know that with the power of the Holy Spirit, God's not going to let you down. He will always give you that way through. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he will never bring anything on you that isn't pretty common with everybody. It happens everywhere. And he will, and, uh, he will never test you over what you can handle. Some people can take more than others. God can depend on some more than others. But he loves them all the same. But if you can put out much and do much work, uh, then that's, that's blessings at Judgment Day also. And he loves those that love him, that follow him. He pays them all the same. He's going to use his election. That's why that uh, he calls them. That's why he sees, this chapter lets you know, he sees all things, there's nothing hidden from him. So uh, that's why repentance is ever so important. Let him know that you love him. Let him use you. That's what he wants. Use you simply to love him. You've done your part when you do that. That is the main thing he wants from you is your love. That's documented in the last verse of Revelation chapter 4. That uh, he created you for his pleasure. How long has it been since you pleasured him? Think about it. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about some reverend, some denomination, or some organization. We do not judge people. We have one judge, that's our Father. You do have the right for spiritual discernment to know what you should hear and what you should put to the side. That's a gift from God, thank him for that. Let him know you love him, that's what he truly wants from you. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request, you don't need that number, you don't need an address, nothing's hidden from God. He knows what you're thinking even. You don't even have to say it out loud. Therefore, let him know that you love him. Don't ever, ever, ever try to con him. That, that won't work. Why? Because he, he knows your very mind. So, again, having a father like that, love him and be blessed. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with Brenda from Kentucky. 
Where can I find the scripture that speak about the fallen angels refusing to be born of woman, and um, and they and and why? Maybe maybe that's what that's supposed to be. Well, you're, you're going to find it uh, documented in more than one place, but basically your main place would be Genesis chapter 6. That's when the deed took place. But the place where you know what their sin was, you will find in the book of Jude, just before the great book of Revelation. In the first six verses, it will tell you they are locked in chains for destruction. Why? Because they left their first place of habitation, which means they came from heaven to seduce woman, not to be born of her. Angela from North Carolina, what race are the Gentiles? The, the Gentiles are many races. This is why Gentiles is usually plural. Anytime you see one, um, that's why even nations is usually plural. Because on the sixth day, God created all peoples. Hebrew tongue, Goy. In the Greek tongue, uh, ethnos. And from the Greek word ethnos, we have, our, um, we have um, the ethnic peoples. It means all races. And are they any less than anyone else? No, God, they're children of God, and God loves them. But God has a plan and a purpose. And through Eth Ha'adon, he brought Christ, which would be Savior for all peoples. So, um, therefore, um, that's why it's still so very important that the house of Israel and the house of Judah accomplish what it is they're supposed to do prophetically, because that's who God uses to bring salvation even to the Gentile. It is written in Romans and Paul's writings in Romans chapter 11 that the spirit, there will still be 7,000 that will not bow a knee to Baal, meaning Antichrist. And many God placed the spirit of slumber on so that they can't, they, they're just blind to the truth, actually. Therefore, they're not guilty and can be taught in the millennium rather than knowing the truth and sinning and, uh, and being fini. But he, he states there that the house of Israel and the house of Judah being the tame olive tree, and olive tree being el -yah in the Greek spelling, meaning the sacred name of God, is that some of those branches fell off that the wild olive, meaning the Gentiles, could be grafted in. And through Christ's death on the cross, he opened that salvation to whomsoever will. And therefore, the Gentile has salvation as well as the house of Israel or the house of Judah. On, that is to say, on repentance and loving the Lord Jesus Christ. Pat from Utah, where in the Bible does it tell the actual birth date and conception of Christ? Well, it, it, it's in Luke chapter 1, basically. But you have to know what the course of Abaya is, because that's when that's when um, Elizabeth's husband was doing his course, and when when you know when that course is, then that establishes the birth date and conception of John the Baptist. And then on when John the Baptist was six months exactly to the day in the womb. The angel approached Mary, she conceived, and rushed that same day to her cousin Elizabeth. And as Mary approached Elizabeth at, on the day of conception, John leapt in her womb because he felt the presence of the Holy Spirit, even a babe unborn. Um, so, um, but, but the date is there, but you need a little help in understanding Abaya what that date is and so forth, and um, the courses of uh, the 24 courses of the, the priest. That's, that's a date. Uh, Janie from Tennessee. Who are the four angels in Revelation chapter 9, verses 14 and 15? When are they coming? Are they coming before the Antichrist or before the two witnesses? What is their mission? They probably will come before any of the uh, four mentioned. 
because they are released during basically the time of the swarming. They are released just immediately during or before the sixth trump. And that's moving on in. Now, we will have signs and we will have um, likenesses to keep us on our toes. If it is the real thing, then we know what follows that. That, that would be the time the four angels would be released. Now, it's important that you know who those four angels are, not by name, but by condition. Number one, they are, as you will read in the ninth chapter of Revelation, they are bound. Well, pray tell me why are they bound? Because they are of, of the group I foretold you about that are locked in chains. They're wicked, evil, um, very evil angels. And um, when, when the mobs on the east of the Euphrates swarm, then you will begin to see the presence of wickedness and evilness and bloodshed and things that um, are, are unbecoming humanity. So you kind of have to judge yourself. There's a lot of bloodshed going on east of the Euphrates right now. Jerry from Arkansas, when you say you will get what's coming to you, is that this life or the millennium? Both. God, God is always, he's a fair shooter. And whether it's good, bad, or ugly, you're going to get it. Okay. Uh, but, but is it, you know, um, quite frankly, if I fall off course to where I'm unpleasing to God, um, do I resent him thumping my gourd? No, you want to be happy when he thumps your gourd. Wakes you up and gets you back in the harness. <clears throat> get you back working in the very word itself. That's the way God operates. It is, it is, he, he only corrects, that is to say, those that he loves. So it's good. Sometimes even when you're trying to do good and you mess up, he's going to get your attention, but don't hold that against him. He does it because he loves you. It's called tough love. And when God loves you, it is tough love when you fall out of step. But that's good, because you want to be back in step where you have the blessings. It's, it's a gift from God. Dorothy from Arkansas, what scripture do you give about living in heaven before this earth age, and how do you know if you are one of the elect? If you know the Antichrist is coming before the true Christ does, most likely you are one of God's elect. There's a reason you know. God wants you to know. But um, to know that you lived before, uh, how about the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where God says, I chose you before the foundations of this earth. How about Romans chapter 8, along about verse 26, where it says, you don't even know what to pray for if you're one of the saints, set aside ones, elect. So therefore, God will intercede in your life because you were foreordained. That means ordained from before. Before what? Before this earth age. Before the, really to be real specific, and I probably should not use this, but the katabo, the overthrow of Satan. Why? Because you stood against Satan. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 4, where we taught there, beginning with verse 18, my people are just a little bit on the stupid side, God says. Sodish is the word. But let's, let's, let's say it like it is, stupid. They don't realize there was an earth age before this, and they messed around and messed around until finally I destroyed the whole bunch. Every town, every city, it wasn't Noah's flood. I mean, I cleaned them out. And I started all over. And what he's saying is, is don't mess with me. I could do it again. Okay. And um, uh, he's not going to because... There's too many of God's elect that are going to intercede and we're on that path, that way, which is Christ, to the very time. Sabrina from South Carolina. What is the unforgivable sin, unpardonable sin? You can read of it in Luke chapter 12, verse 10. And it has to do 
with uh, the end times, when you are delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, if you refuse, you can, you can refuse in your little life some of the things that Christ taught. Maybe you didn't understand them or something. But if you know enough to be delivered up before the Antichrist, synagogue of Satan, and you refuse the Holy Spirit, the opportunity to speak through you, that is unpardonable. And it should be. Do I think it will happen? No, I do not think it will happen. I know God's elect pretty well. If, if anything, they're going to have more trouble not premeditating what they'll say than they will uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak. They, they want to talk, okay? They're not going to hold their peace and, and unless they really concentrate and stay focused. So I, I do not think it's possible to commit the unpardonable sin because they're all lathered up and ready to go against the, the evil one. Steve from Arizona, how do we know the length of the short season when Satan is released? Well, well you, you do it by, by um, knowing and observing God's plan. How, how long would Satan be here but just short season? Well, how long do we know? Revelation chapter 9, five months. Five months is a short season. And so you can probably just about rest. That's five of our months, not God's, okay? That's a short season. Uh, Keith from Kentucky. How do you feel about the books that are not included in the Bible? Well, some of them are actual and some of them are not. You have to be very careful. There is one way that we have of tracking and that is the Masara. If they're not in the Masara, then you're probably in a heap of hurt to believe they're authentic. So, um, example, in the Apocrypha, you have Esdras 1 and 2. Well, Esdras is simply the Greek word for Ezra. And um, uh, the Masara itself will back up those two books. So, which means you can accept the Apocrypha's uh, book of Ezra 1 and 2. Esdras, rather. Carol from Pennsylvania. Could you answer a question, is there an animal heaven? I want to think so, but my brother-in-law, who is a, whoop, uh, a minister, um, I, I'm not going to mention what kind of minister, okay? I don't do that. Says I'm wrong, that heaven is so full that there isn't any room for dogs and cats, thanks. Well, that, that's kind of sad, Carol, because uh, it shows that um, you, uh, your brother-in-law, is uh, he's not familiar with Isaiah chapter 11, which is the millennium. It says all the animals are going to be there, not just dogs and cats. There's bear, there's lion. There are snakes, serpents, asp, they're called. And, um, but no, they're not carnivores because they also are spiritual. Uh, read it for yourself. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11. And, and sometimes some reverends will try to tell you the Old Testament is past history. Most of the prophecy is in the Old Testament. Okay? Isaiah is a prophet to Israel, the house of Israel. And it very much applies uh, to today. That's what prophecy is about. And that, that will help you. God loves his animals. He had them in the first earth age. That's why we find artifacts and remains and make such a good study of it. And, and they're going to be, be forever. Gail from Alabama. My question is, I feel that my son, let's see. The Father sent me to you when my son died in 1997. I was so lost, and I asked God to please help me understand where my son was because what I had been taught didn't feel right. And God opened my mind to learn the truth, and he sent you to teach me. My question is, I feel that my son's dying was meant to be for me to learn the truth word of God, and I feel okay with that. Is this wrong to feel that way? Well, it, it, it isn't wrong, but be more inclusive. It means that sometimes things happen, like uh, Luke chapter 13 would say, that when the Tower of Siloam fell on 18 people and they died, it, it was just an accident. 
But at the same time, God does work in miraculous ways to comfort, and that's what he sent the word for you, was to comfort you over that passing. And I'm sure your son probably is pulling for you to learn that word and want you to know he's in good shape too. Rush from, from Wisconsin. When Satan sets up his throne on earth uh, to persuade all the different religions that he is their Christ, is it possible that he will appear to be Mohammed, Buddha, Jesus Christ, and other saviors, just as when the elect will speak through the Spirit? It's, of course, he's going to be the it to everyone. And uh, don't worry, with the miracles that he will perform, uh, he won't have any trouble persuading the world. When you read um, uh, Revelation chapter 13, verses 11, which speaks of this one, it looks like the Lamb of God. He's got the horns, looks like the Lamb, but it's Satan's voice. It's the dragon's voice, because it is Satan playing Lamb of God. And he can perform all these miracles like snapping his fingers and lightning coming down from heaven. Can you imagine if you called a roll call and had a big church meeting and some guy gets front and snaps his fingers and lightning, boom, comes down from heaven, you would have a hallelujah glory bunch going, I mean, overtime right there, if they're ignorant of God's word. If you know God's word, you know you got the Antichrist up there because only he, before the second advent, can do such a thing. Yeah, he don't persuade, he, he's very persuasive. Uh, Brian from Washington before Satan stands in Mount Zion making his claim to be Christ, should we expect further destruction of Jerusalem, including the Wailing Wall, perhaps by the house of Judah itself, with, notwithstanding whether the Kenites or the true house commit the act? Further, should we expect that consequences to, consequent to this destruction that the temple in Zion is to be rebuilt? No. No, the only temple we're concerned about here in the end times is the many-membered body of Christ. There's not going to be, God's not going to allow any destruction, any atomic holocaust, or anything. That destruction that Christ spoke of concerning the Wailing Wall or any monument or building on Mount Zion is when the false Christ is cleansed, when, when his ilk is cleansed from it. And then the Millennium Temple will be built, and not until then. Betty from Florida, would you please tell me where in the Bible it says the Lord doesn't like them that teach his children to fly? I'd be happy to. It's Ezekiel chapter 13, uh, beginning with about verse 20. He said, uh, and a little before, he said, You sow, talking to the, his bride-to-be, the daughters of Jerusalem, of Israel, of Judah, you sow kerchiefs to cover every knuckle on my outreach saving arms with deception, with false teaching, and, and you teach my children to fly to save their souls and I'm against it. You know, that would get, that should get most people's attention because um, the very word of Satan as it is written in Mark 13, when it said, when, that, when they tell you he's in the field or in the desert or in Jerusalem, don't go. It's not the real Christ. Now, that is biblical. That's the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not go. If you're still in a flesh body, that dude is a fake. Because the moment that Christ returns, the true one, we are changed into spiritual bodies. Okay, But many people are going to be deceived by that false one. Because he, he has such powers as we forementioned, and so it is. Uh, Linda from New Zealand. Uh, the other day I heard you talk about the following subjects. Is war being waged in the heavens? You said this is the year to watch for the following reasons. I'm not quoting you verbatim. This is only from memory. During the year 2012, a great circle compasses, crosses the galactic equator moving westward when it arrives in time for the winter solstice on December the 21st, the Mayan calendar ends on this date. The last time this event took place was 25,800 years ago. That is correct. 
it, she zeroes out right in the middle of the Milky Way, okay? January, there's no planet alignment, though, as many people are thinking. January the 15th, 2012, the war planet Mars moved into Virgo and will begin retrograde on the 24th of January until July 2012. That, that is correct. As a matter of fact, um, it, a little sooner than that, it will be back in the sign of Leo, the lion, okay? Virgo is the sign of the virgin, although many believe that Christ was born on December the 25th. The word of God supports that he was conceived on that date and began dwelling with, uh, with us until his birth on September the 29th. This means that Christ was born under the astrological sign of the virgin, Virgo, and you are correct. Unbelievable today, I read on January the 23rd, 2012, begins the Chinese New Year. It is called the Year of the Dragon. Uh, not a date. Uh, note the date. It is on the very crisp crust, rather, of the period of Mars moving into Virgo. And you are right. And, hey, it's good to hear from you from New Zealand, one of my favorite places. I had Dr. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the most favorite doctors, mentors I've ever had was born in New Zealand. Uh, Dr. Barry Fell, I loved him very much. God bless you. Thanks for calling, uh, writing. Okay, we're out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, but most of all, God loves you for studying His Word. Makes His day. When you make God's day, boy, is He going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Uh, most important, though, Listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Book of Peter. Here we have two books, First and Second Peter that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman, which in his gentleness and his kindness brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. Say, God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back into our Father's Word, as always. Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses. Let me bring you up to speed here from the last lecture, in case you missed it. In Revelation chapter 15, it stipulates that those that had the victory over the beast, that's to say the one world system, the Antichrist, over his name, over the number 